Join in, get in, that's it. Keep it up, keep it up. Keep it up, keep it up. Now I'm gonna walk at a constant velocity, and every time you hit the beat, I'm gonna put a mark here, all right? How's the spacing? Pretty good. Certain distance, you're good, nice time interval, and therefore, what's my velocity? It's constant. Now, I don't care what your time interval is in seconds, nor what that distance is in cubits, in meters, or whatever. All I care is that you kept a constant time interval, and that distance I went was constant in each interval, and therefore, my velocity is constant. Now, what's accelerated motion like? Well, let's try it again. Come on, give me some. Okay. You see how it's sitting there? Well, for me, of course, being from Chicago originally, uh, UIC represents, in a sense, coming home again. Uh, but in general, I think, for a place like UIC, there are six things. Uh, First of all, there's what I call location, location, location. And then the other three are opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. And it's not only for me, but for the faculty and for the students. We're in a, a marvelous area. There's all kinds of cultural things. There's opera, ballet, symphonies, there's jazz, there's blues. And I know my colleagues love some of the jazz or blues clubs in the Chicago area. If I take this ball and drop it, it falls straight down. Now, if I start walking with it, what's it going to do? And he did this example, not with a ball. He did with a ball and a ship, but I'm going to do it here with me. If I'm walking along holding the ball, I'm moving with a certain velocity, and so is the, the ball. If I let it go, what is the ball going to do? It's going to, continue, it's going to go down, but what about this direction? What's the ball going to do in this direction? He said, since there are no forces in this direction, when I let the ball go, if I'm moving with a velocity v, what will the ball do? It will also move with a velocity v, and therefore, when it falls, guess where it will fall? Right into my hand. It won't be left behind. OK, I'll try it. I'll kill myself. Well, here it is. I'm going to walk along. Bingo. Uh, yeah, you have to, uh, have to make up your mind that you're going to work. Uh, and work is important. Study is important. You have to uh, temper study with uh, entertainment and, and getting out, sure. But your job here during these four years was uh, to be a, a student and put in the hours. And if you're not prepared to do that, then this is not the place for you. But if you are prepared to do it, then UIC can be a wonderful home for four years and, and a step into the future, and a big step into the future. What I do and my co-authors do is to subject economic models to testing with data and challenge the assumptions of economic models with the data and try to construct new models. And what I'm going to focus on today is an area <clears throat> we call game theory, where what we try to do is to understand how individuals will behave in certain kinds of situations 
And there's some very clear theoretical models that have been developed, which we have challenged with some data. I think like an economist. I think in terms of abstract models. I think in terms of data. I think in terms of proposing hypotheses and testing them with data. And it turned out I was in history. And it turned out that's not the way historians think. I still love history. I still spend a lot of time reading history, even doing history. But in terms of communicating with my colleagues, economics is exactly the right field. I went to graduate school and fell in love with economics. But if it goes to $100, everybody will behave like the model. Well, maybe, except an alternative way of looking at it is the more money is at stake, the higher the opportunity cost of being wrong. OK, so if, you, if you're wrong at $100, you lose more than if you're wrong at $10. UIC's got everything. It's in the, it's in the city. So all the arts are all around. You can go to the art museum. You can go to the symphony. You can go to the opera. You can go to the theater. It has some of the best faculty in the world, so you can take classes in anything you want to take classes in. It's the fifth most diverse university in the country, so you, you have students from all backgrounds around you. It's the United Nations. It's the workplace of the 21st century. The students who come here will go right into the workplace, and they'll know how to talk and interact with students of all different cultures. You can live on campus or off campus. We make arrangements for students who are working. You can be full-time. You can be part-time. Uh, we have the largest health science campus in the country, tremendous opportunities for undergraduate research, opportunities for students in all majors to be, participate in music and theater and athletics. It has everything a student could want. You unravel those chromosomes, you get your chromatin, and inside of this is wrapped DNA. And the DNA contains the sequence of messages that tell the body, this is what's going to happen, this is not what's going to happen. And so the future is going to be unraveling this mystery and seeing, in fact, if this is genetically determined. It was a profession that had great challenges. There were great unknowns. It challenges everything about you as a person. It challenges your mind. It challenges your character. It challenges your soul. So it was an ideal specialty and an ideal profession for me to enter. This man has an, a, a cholesterol plaque right here, which is almost shutting off his blood vessels. Okay. The question is, what do we do for this man? So we've developed a computer program that allows us to, to measure what the blood flow is in multiple blood vessels going to the brain. There isn't anything like this that exists today in the world. And what it does is we can tell you actually what the flow is, for example, in one of the arteries. This is an artery in the back of the brain. Now, there's something wrong about this, and that is you see that there's negative flow. It shouldn't happen. UIC is an excellent university, and it happens to be one of the most affordable universities in this country, again, located in a great city. So it has a combination of things for any student that would be attractive. And it was built to display the new wealth of the Industrial Revolution, our machinery. This is a major change uh, in the world. Architecture was now being built for more uses and for more people. What was the result? Wealth was being dispersed. We were having new ideas about architecture. Methods and uh, speed of communication of ideas had increased. So this building has a lot of ideas borrowed from all different types of countries. But even more interesting is the means of construction had changed. We no longer built buildings in place. 
we actually built building components elsewhere, brought them to the site, and hoisted them into place. This was a substantial change in the way we built architecture. And these materials and means of construction were things that architects learned from the Industrial Revolution and the new materials that we gained from it and the new methods of construction, of mass production. We, too, adopted mass production techniques just as you do in manufacturing a car. I actually was a combination major in, in college. I was both um, a math major and a studio arts major. And I was this split kind of person who loved the fine arts, but also loved the sciences. And it was the advice of my brother as I was trying to figure out, how am I ever going to reconcile such divergent interests? And my brother said, well, why not think about architecture? I frankly didn't have a clue what that meant. I knew there were buildings all around me, but I didn't have any idea of what the practice of architecture was like. But on a lark, I uh, approached the dean of the School of Architecture in, in a university in New York City, who invited me to uh, join the student body. This was August. I joined the student body in September and very quickly learned what architecture was about and found out that actually it was a fabulous um, choice to make because architecture does involve multiple disciplines and finding a synthesis between those various disciplines. Look at this. I mean, can you imagine trying to build that? Well, here's how he does it, and it's kind of amazing. Gary designs in models. He doesn't design in drawings. And once he gets a model that's the way he likes it, he then uses a sophisticated medical computer technology in which he takes a scanner that he moves across the surface of the model. And that information, just as you'd move it across the surface of the body, or in this instance, on the internal part of the body when it, people are trying, uh, doctors are trying to represent internal organs, for example. He moves this instrument along the model. That information is communicated into a computer, into a computer program that then spins out in detail every piece that has to be manufactured and put together on the building. So without this sophisticated medical computer technology, that building would not be built today. Uh, UIC is one of the most diverse universities in the United States that also is an exceptionally strong research one university and with an equally exceptionally strong faculty. And this is very unusual. We don't normally get such strong educational institutions which have this type of diverse student body. If you think that the First Amendment has a purpose, then it is at least theoretically possible, and indeed in the history has often been the case, that some forms of speech will be seen to subvert that purpose rather than to further it. There will be forms of speech in the judgment of the community that rather than facilitating the free flow of ideas, shuts out ideas by intimidating a whole group of people, let's say, from expressing their ideas. Or there may be a form of speech which, rather than encouraging uh, the search for truth, um, actually uh, claims uh, and claims authoritatively that the search for truth cannot go in a certain direction. Therefore, that form of speech, especially if it's put forward by powerful interests in the society, should not be allowed, and so forth and so on. What brought me to UIC was the sense of a new adventure. I could have either retired or continued to do what I was doing at Duke, which is a very nice place, or try something in an institution unlike anything I had ever known. That is an urban institution with a population of inner city students and also a population of students just as I was 40 years ago. I was the son of an immigrant and the first in my family to go to college. The First Amendment, remember, protects your freedom of speech and presumes, this is one of its assumptions, that American men and women are capable of sorting out the good from the bad by themselves and therefore do not need the government to interfere by choosing the good speech or ruling out the bad speech. Education, on the other hand, runs on exactly the opposite principle. 
Education assumes, and I'm not passing judgment on this assumption one way or the other, education assumes that you, that is high school students, junior high school students, certainly elementary, high, elementary students, are not yet capable of determining what is good and is bad or bad in any area, including speech or books and so forth. And therefore, you must be brought along to the point where you're able to make autonomous decisions. Now, I hope the contradiction in this is clear. What it says is, you must be constrained by us in order that you can finally be free. Not all high school seniors should consider UIC. If you want that experience, and it's a good experience, of an undergraduate institution that's more or less a fortress, or an enclosed garden, such as, for example, Duke University, then UIC isn't the place for you. UIC is about to do something unique in the history of higher education. That is, combine an urban institution, an institution that really does situate itself in the city, not in an adversarial relationship, but in a relationship of partnership. And at the same time, UIC is fast becoming, already is, I think, a world-class research institution with hundreds of millions of dollars of research and extraordinary internationally known scholars. That's a combination that has never been put together before in American education. It's going to be put together in the next two to five years, and it would be exciting for any student to be here.